So in just one session this afternoon, I'd like to introduce a fourth interpretation or method of mindfulness of breathing. And this comes from the Dzogchen school of Tibetan Buddhism, Indo-Tibetan Buddhism. It's rooted in India, but really flowered in Tibet over the last 1,200 years. Great perfection. I'll give a very brief introduction now, but we'll return to it later. The Great perfection, it's regarded by especially the followers of the Nyingma tradition, one of the four orders of Tibetan Buddhism, as really the culmination, the grand finale of all of the Buddhist teachings. And it is a whole matrix of theory, of view, and meditation, and a whole way of life profoundly integrated, and that's what I've been focusing on for about the last 30 years. It was what first drew me to Tibetan Buddhism. The first book I ever picked up on Tibetan Buddhism was about Dzogchen. I could hardly understand any of it, and yet I felt this is it. This is what I want to devote my life to. But I quickly came under the, um, under the wing, under the guidance of His Holiness Dalai Lama, and he made sure I didn't get to it for 20 years. <laughs> it's a really wonderful thing. He made sure I really got a solid foundation. Because I was ready to skip everything else and just go to Dzogchen. Uh, but it was only about almost 20 years later, 19 years later, that I received my first Dzogchen teaching from him. Uh, so that was wonderful. In the last 29 years or so, then receiving a cornucopia of teachings, guided meditations, and so forth, pith instructions from quite a number of lamas, more, more teaching from His Holiness, but also quite a number of other Nyingma lamas, and above all, my really revered lama, the Venerable Gaptura Rinpoche. Very brief introduction here. And that is, generally speaking, you know, in Buddhism is the Nambe Chu. It's an, if you call it Nambe Chu, instead of saying Sangye Chu, the Buddha Dhamma, they sometimes call it Nambe Chu, insider Dhamma, insider Dhamma. You know exactly what that means now. But within that, I would say not but, but and, within the whole field of Buddha Dhamma, as being insider, that is, look inside for the answers, the sources of happiness or unhappiness, mm, the key to understanding reality as a whole, Within the whole vast field of Buddha Dhamma, the Dzogchen, one can say, is the insider insider. Because the central, I can say this very shortly, very briefly, and that is the Dzogchen, in terms of the, everything, in terms of view and meditation and way of life, it's all aimed at one thing. To fathom the nature of the mind all the way to the ground, to fathom the nature of consciousness all the way to the ground, to utterly comprehend the nature of consciousness, and by so doing, gain, gain perfect awakening of a Buddha. So what this entails, now briefly put, is that you direct your awareness inwards upon the mind, and by do so doing, do that 10, 15, 30,000 hours, hours, and you'll become very familiar with your human mind. Look at it for tens of thousands of hours, and you'll get a really good idea how the mind works. But then let your mind dissolve, your human mind, let your mind melt, dissolve into its ground. And in the Dzogchen tradition, it's called the Tibetan Kunji Namshe, I will translate as substrate consciousness, a.k.a. bhavanga. Essentially, it looks like very similar, if not identical. So then you, then you fathom not only the mind by really observing it for a long time, but you fathom where it comes from, what it disappears into when you fall asleep, where it comes out from when you wake up, and so on. So that's a deeper insight into the nature of mind when you realize that kind of the H2O of the mind. That is, it's not just human mind, it's deeper, something more primal, common to all sentient beings. This, the, the minds of every sentient being, of each sentient being, emerges from and dissolves back into that sentient beings. I'll say bhavanga again. But let's not stop. Let's ask this question, consciousness. Consciousness itself. Does consciousness exist by its own intrinsic identity? If you like Kant, is consciousness a ding an sich, a thing in and of itself, having its own intrinsic self-nature? Or is consciousness relational, arising in interdependence with other phenomena? And so it's a crucial element. Does, does consciousness have its own intrinsic inherent identity? You probe that, you investigate that. And if you do so, then you may very well discover what thousands of Dzogchen adepts have discovered, and many others, that the mind in fact is empty of its own intrinsic inherent nature. But then you don't stop there, you say, but now, What's the ultimate nature? What's the, can we probe to the depths of the mind? Is there something beyond that? And it's called Rikpa, pristine awareness. It's called Yeshe, primordial consciousness. It's called Dharma, Dharma Kaya. It's called Buddha, 
Buddha mind. It's called Tathagagarbha, Buddha nature. And that is the fathoming the ultimate ground of awareness. And by so doing, you see the role of consciousness in the universe at large. So that's it. That's what you're about. So it's everything is for that. It's everything is for that. To understand the whole of reality, to awaken to the whole of reality by fathoming the nature of consciousness to its ultimate ground. That's it. That's a summary of Dokian right there. <coughs> I could elaborate a lot on this, but we have, I'd like to get meditation quickly. But I will say this because we are living in this modern world in the 21st century, and the dominant knowledge paradigm for the whole world right now, and has been for some centuries by now, of course, is science. Religions, religions have their very differing views, and philosophers disagree on everything, but come up with a lot of right ideas. But the scientists have come up with an enormous body, an ever growing body, of consensual knowledge. Whether you're a Chinese scientist or you're from Bulgarian or an Argentinian, the textbooks are pretty much the same. It's not culturally bound, so to speak. And ever since Galileo, wanting to, it's, I find it, it's hard for me to be brief, Galileo is a profoundly religious person, a very devout Roman Catholic. And he was trained as a contemplative as a youth, and he wanted to stay as a contemplative and spend his whole life there. His father wouldn't pay for it. Father Bates said, go off to university to get a job. Sent him off to med school at the University of Pisa. Didn't like it, went into mathematics. That turned out well. And, but he was really, according to Einstein and many other people, and me too, he is the founder of modern science. And where he was looking, wh and why was he looking? Why would he care whether Jupiter has moons? Why would he care whether there's spots on the sun, the moon has craters? Why would he care? And he did care passionately. And because he was a devout Christian and he wasn't allowed to go inward as a contemplative, his father said, come out and get a job. So his aspiration, as he said, was, I want to understand the mind of the creator. The contemplatives have a route for doing that, but that door was closed to me. So I would like to know the mind of the creator by way of his creation. If you want to know the nature of the, the, the clockmaker's mind, look at the clock. And so therefore, to understand the mind of the creator, I will try to fathom the nature of creation. And that was, it was a fundamentally a theological motivation. So the notion of science being value-free has never been true. It was theologically driven and not just by him. But the approach that he took was looking outwards to the objective, the f objective, the physical, and quantifiable, because that's God's creation is out there, not in the human mind. So I'm like, this is God's creation, look out. In the beginning, God created. And tell, it doesn't tell about how God created the human mind, but it tells a lot about how God created everything else. And so that's what we've been doing. For the first 300 years of science, they never got around to a scientific study of the mind. By the time they did in the light, late 19th century, they thought they had reality pretty well wrapped up. And they thought with the preservation of matter and energy that anything that's not physical could not possibly have any influence in the physical world. Therefore, if the mind is not physical, it's, it's inert. And that's, that was the, the milieu, the intellectual climate in which modern psychology had its birthing pains with William James, Wilhelm Bund, and so forth. And after a very brief 35 years of really emphasizing uh, introspection, the behaviors came along and steamrolled that. And ever since then, Scientists have been trying to understand the mind and eventually consciousness by way of brain and behavior. Behavior first, brain, and interviews. So we've been trying, scientifically, trying to understand the whole of reality by looking outwards. Getting right around to the mind last, took 300 years before they started. And my dear and late friend Francisco Varela, a world-class neuroscientist, said through the, through the 20th century, as a neuroscientist, you'd never mention the word consciousness. It was taboo. Don't talk about it. Literally. Don't talk about it. It makes us feel uncomfortable. We don't know what to do with it, so shut up. But if you want to talk about it over tea, or when you're shoot, shooting whiskey, but don't talk about it in the lab. It's not a scientific question. And now over the last couple of decades, it's become scientifically OK. But of course, all the emphasis is on the brain. How does the brain generate consciousness? So there's still, so this is the one, the kind of the missing piece. We've gotten pretty much everything solved, except for, you know, little things like dark matter and dark energy, which is about 96% of the universe. But about, apart from that, we've got everything pretty well wrapped up. <laughs> and then mind consciousness, that's a mystery. Well, if there's something beautiful here. I'm not ridiculing science, I love science. But there's this complementarity of learning so much about the nature of reality by looking outwards, inwards. And Buddha Dhamma in general, 
is looking out inwards to outwards, and then Dzogchen is utterly looking from inwards to outwards. To fathom the nature of mind is to awaken to the whole of reality. Okay, I'm finished. That's the introduction. So now we take Dzogchen approach to mindfulness of breathing. There is such. I don't know how far back it goes, but I'm probably pretty old. And so the central theme that we'll see starting tomorrow, when it comes to shamatha, for example, is you're directing awareness away from all the sensory fields, just the opposite of what Galileo did. You're directing it inwards to the nature of mind, and you, you can achieve shamatha by focusing on your mind. Right? So it's all looking inwards, mind, consciousness, substrate consciousness, or bhavanga, and then going all the way down to the ultimate ground. So our Dzogchen approach to mindfulness of breathing is going to start out with that, with that mood, that orientation, where your primary focus of your awareness is just sustaining something that is already happening. Is anybody here not aware of whether right now you're aware or not? Okay, good. I asked that in Spain a couple of years ago and two hands went up. I really didn't know what to do. <laughs> How could I persuade them that they're not conscious, you know, or that they are conscious? I don't think I'm conscious. <laughs> I didn't know what to do at all, but you Aussies, you know, you have your feet on the ground. That's good. And so, but that's the point. You're already aware of being aware. So this approach is then not doing more, it's doing less, because now you're not only being aware of being aware, but you're also aware of me, for example, and the room, and your bodies, and whether there's smoke in the air, and so forth. So the shamatha, which we'll get to right on Saturday, is just awareness of awareness. It's not doing something more, it's doing enormously amount less. But we're going to take the taste of that and couch it a nice, comfortable cradle of the breath. Let's just do it. Please find a comfortable position. especially for the meditation now and the meditations to come over the next several days. I believe you will find that the more deeply you're able to settle your body, relax, still, and vigilant, your breathing effortlessly flowing in, flowing out, an awareness resting in stillness in the midst of the hurry and flurry of the mind, the more deeply you're able to settle in these three ways, the more effective you'll find the main practices that we will explore. So please settle body, speech, and mind now, as you've done before.
culmination of this gradual sequential settling is when you do experience awareness resting. Resting right where it is without being directed outwards or inwards. Simply being present, simply being there. at ease, effortless, resting in stillness, resting in that natural clarity of awareness, wakeful, clear, bright. When you have that experience, now you are settling the mind in its natural state, that stillness in the midst of the motions of the mind, the motions of the breath, the rising and falling of appearances in the surrounding environment, that stillness within, movement, simplicity, simplicity within the context of complexity. Now for the main practice, let your eyes be at least partially open, softly open. Evenly rest your awareness in the space in front of you. In other words, release any sense of your awareness being inside your head, which is a complete myth. You rest your awareness in space without focusing on any object. Just be mindfully present in the present moment, aware of being aware. not thinking about awareness, that would mediate our experience of being aware. It is direct, it's non-conceptual, unmediated, the raw, naked experience of being aware, of awareness. Now as you rest there, to the best of your ability, simply sustain with very little effort this flow of mindful presence. Sustaining the awareness of being aware without being distracted, without being drawn away by sensory impressions of thoughts, memories, imagination. Sustaining that mindful stillness without distraction and without grasping. And grasping means without identifying with any of the thoughts, emotions, desires that arise from the mind. Let them arise. Let them come and let them go. But be so loose and relaxed that your awareness remains still in the midst of the comings and goings of the mind. The awareness of being aware. Now this is subtle, and if you're new to this practice, you may find it very elusive. You may be wondering whether you're doing it right. Keep it simple. You are aware of being aware already. So that's it. But to hold this practice, give us something a little bit to hold on to. Keep us grounded in the present moment. As you're resting there in that flow of being aware, of being aware, without trying to, you may effortlessly note that you are aware of the rhythm of the breath. You're aware when the breath flows in, you're aware of the breath flowing out, even if you're not directing your attention to any tactile sensations throughout the body, at the abdomen, at the nostrils. Is it not the case that 
when you're simply resting in awareness of awareness, you are peripherally aware of the body breathing, the rhythm of respiration. Let your awareness stay home, resting right where it is, not directing it to the body or to tactile sensations. Rest right where it is. And the experience of the rhythm of the respiration will rise up to meet you effortlessly. Sensing when the breath is flowing in, sensing when the breath is flowing out. Allow that. Resting primarily in the ongoing flow of awareness of awareness. Centrally aware of this this existential reality of being conscious. But peripherally, note the relative duration of each in and out breath. Note the rhythm of the breath. When it is long, note that it is long. When it is short, note that it is short. Again, primarily rest effortlessly in that awareness that was already there, that awareness of being aware. Let that be your primary engagement. Sustaining that without distraction, without grasping. Knowing it before you think anything at all. Because you know it non-conceptually. But peripherally, experiencing the rhythm of the respiration rising up to meet you. With an image just to look at and then release like a lighthouse on a rocky knoll out in the middle of the ocean. Strong, firmly planted lighthouse in a violent storm with waves crashing on the sides of the, white house, of the lighthouse and then withdrawing back into the sea. Another wave surges up and falls back to the sea. The lighthouse does not move, but the waves rise up to meet lighthouse. Let your awareness remain still as the lighthouse, receiving, experiencing the waves of the rhythm of the respiration, rising and falling, and maintaining just that cognizance of recognizing the duration, relative, long or short, of each in and out breath. Let's continue practicing now in silence.
So especially clearly in the Theravada tradition, the reason for practicing shamatha and achieving access to the first jhana, if you just give it in one line, why would you do that? Because it's imperative to fully engage in the practice of vipassana and liberate your mind irreversibly from all afflictions. The mind has to be serviceable. The mind must be freed from these five obscurations which make you like a person who's indebted, sick, in bonds, and so forth. But, and also in the same process, the mind to be able to effectively, with full effectiveness, engage in vipassana, insight meditation, needs to be imbued richly and in a sustainable fashion with these five jhana factors. That's your platform, that's your laboratory. That's your laboratory. Shamatha is like developing a laboratory or de like developing contemplative technology. And vipassana, insight meditation, is like the science. It is science. It's about gaining knowledge, specifically the kind of knowledge that liberates from the inner sources of suffering and brings you to freedom. So there's a very clear sequence between shamatha, I'll, I'll use the Sanskrit terms, shamatha and vipassana. And in the Pali Canon, I think it's worth, worth um, sharing with you, there's a very nice parable the Buddha gives. Um, and that is the parable of the, of the king and the wise minister and the king's foolish son. I'll paraphrase it here, but I've given the source if you want to see it in direct translation. <clears throat> but there was once, once upon a time, there was a king who had a foolish son, a teenager son, drinking, carousing, messing about. And he's a crown prince, and the, and the king was very concerned that his son was really not turning out as he hoped and would make a very poor king. So he thought, I really need to make my son grow up, start taking responsibility. So he called in his, so he decided to then, to get his son to take responsibility. He posted, posted him to be a governor in one of the outlying regions of the kingdom. Give him some responsibility, he'll grow up, he'll grow into the job. But he didn't. He wound up still being a goof off, drinking, carousing, gambling, screwing around, not taking any responsibility at all. Huge disappointment for his dad. And so then his father knowing uh, more has to be done, he called in his chief, wisdom, his, his chief minister, his wise minister, uh, like, state, like secretary of state, something like that. And he called him in and said, I want you to go out to this, to this region where my son is governor. I want you to tell him he has to, he has to shape up. He has to stop this. It's irresponsible. It's embarrassing. He's a, he's a disgrace. And tell him he has to start you know, behaving correctly suitable to, to a prince, a crown prince. And the minister said, <clears throat> Your Majesty, I, I will not accept what you just told me. I will not do it. The king said, Why? Because he's the crown prince, and I'm just a minister. And if I go to him and say, You have to shape and so forth, he's going to kill me. He's not going to listen to what I have to say. He's royalty. I'm not. Why would he listen to me? And the king says, I see you have a point. You have a point. How about I give you bodyguard, a whole, my, my, elite, my elite troops to protect you, and also the head of these elite troops, the, the, the palace guard, he's a big, burly, tough guy. How about you let him be your personal bodyguard with these troops behind? Would you go then? And the minister said, yeah, then I will, then I will. And so they all headed off to that, to that, that city, what have you, the capital of that, of that region, and the bodyguard and, the, and the, the minister walked right into the royal chamber where the prince was, but the bodyguard went in front of the minister, the great big burly guy, kind of like an Australian rugby player, something like that, I think. And the bodyguard went right up to the prince, grabbed by the hair, slammed his head down on the ground, took out his sword, held it over the prince's neck and said, listen to the minister. <laughs> and he did, and it turned out well. So that's the story, that's a Buddhist story. And then the analogy is that the minister, that the prince is your unruly mind. The unruly mind, dominated by malice and hedonism and laxity and dullness and excitation, anxiety and uncertain, and all, just kind of all kinds of mental afflictions. They're dominating the place like an unruly prince. Uh, and the wise minister is Vipassana. Wise minister, Vipassana, insight, knowledge. But the big burly bodyguard is shamatha. You need to subdue the prince first with shamatha. Subdue the five obscurations. Almost like you give them chloroform so they all pass out. And then you bring in the, 
you bring in the wise minister of Vipassana, and Vipassana then can go and sever the roots of all the mental afflictions. And, the, and it's, Vipassana frees you, but only if there's a union of shamatha and Vipassana. Vipassana by itself will never free anybody of anybody. Because you're going to practice, let's say you've never, never done any real shamatha practice, and you just go and start practicing Vipassana. Well, who's going to win? Your mental afflictions, which 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 been dominating your mind your whole life, and this new kid on the block, Vipassana, your mental afflictions are bound to just beat up Vipassana. You know? And Vipassana doesn't have to stand a chance of eradicating even one mental affliction. So you bring in the, the foreguard, you bring in the troops first to subdue the mind, and then you liberate the mind. So that's classic Buddhist practice. Largely ignored nowadays, but that's what the Buddha taught. Now there's something very fascinating here. It took me a long time to discover it. Again, we're staying with this, with the, um, well, this is the last bit from the Pali Canon, then we'll slip over into the Mahayana. But there's something called the Chitta Nimitta, or is it another term? I think it's Chitta Nimitta. Chitta Sa Nimittam. Yeah, chitta, okay, basically the same. The sign of the mind. That's not self-explanatory at all. I will say very briefly here, because this could turn into a half an hour talk, and I'd like for it not to. But I mentioned that when you achieve shamatha by way of mindfulness of breathing, your awareness shifts it crosses the threshold from the desire realm, this world that we're familiar with, into the form realm, rupa datu, everywhere acknowledged. This is universal in Buddhism. That's what it means to achieve shamato, access to the first jhana, threshold to the first jhana, and the first jhana is in the form realm. So if you achieve access, and that's simply by achieving a shamatha, then you've crossed the threshold into that domain, and by so doing, you overcome, you make go dormant the five obscurations, and you fully manifest in a sustainable way the five jhana factors. Accessing that domain of reality, now this is not individual, that is, there is a form realm, just like there's a physical universe, there's a form realm and it's, um, and it's experienced by many beings. All right, so it's not just your own individual one. The form realm, and now this is straight from the Theravada tradition, I've seen it more clearly here than anywhere else, the form realm is a domain in which there are nimittas or signs, which we can now shift over into English archetype, archetypes, archetypes of the fundamental constituents of this world. For example, earth, water, fire, air. Earth as in anything is solid, not just dirt. And water, anything that's fluid, fluidity itself, so solidity itself, fluidity itself, the gradient from cold to hot, and then motility, motility, movement of all kinds. Well, we're experiencing the whole universe, the physical universe is created of earth, water, fire, and air, taking place within space. But the archetype, there's an archetype of the earth element, archetype of water, fire, air, and other archetypes. And it is said, now this is classic Buddhist cosmology of the relationship between the form realm and the desire realm, that the desire realm in cosmogony in the evolution, the formation of a cosmos, a world system, is that the desire realm actually emerges from an underlying dimension of reality that's pure form, rupa datu, form. It's very much akin to Plato, very much akin to Pythagoras, that said the whole universe, that everything boils down to number, number. From number comes form, from form, geometrical form comes the whole universe. That's Pythagoras, who was a contemporary of Buddha. And so this is definitely a kissing cousin of that. Plato's whole notion of ideal forms, of ideas from which the whole phenomenal world emerges, definitely in the same, same ballpark. And so, this is now straight Buddhism. But it is to say then, in this view, true or false, this is the view, that everything that is solid, the stand for a microphone, eyeglasses, head, everything that's solid, these are all emerging from archetypes of earth element, and so forth. I'll, I'll leave it at that. There's a lot more to be said, but it's, there's the view. And that you can, if you achieve shamatha, especially you fully achieve the first jhana, then you can actually master, with your mind you can master, you can utilize, you can move these archetypes in the form realm. It's really wild. If you'd like to see a superb book that dis dis discusses this with authority, look at a book called Buddhist Meditation in Theory and Practice by Vajira, Vajira, um, Vajiranyana. It's a free download. It's a free download. Outstand outstanding scholarship by a Sri Lankan monk. I studied it when I was in retreat in Sri Lanka many years ago. 
Then we can ask, from what does the mind emerge? Your mind, my mind, this mind in this world. You have a mind that's a human mind, arises in dependence upon the brain, conditioned by the brain, your nervous system, the environment, DNA, brain chemistry, conditioned by all kinds of things. But from what does it actually emerge? Your mind, with your hopes, fears, desires, emotions, dreams, and everything. From what does it emerge? Because your mind hasn't been here forever. Your mind, you may be 40 years old. Your mind, it wasn't here 60 years ago. So sometime between 60 years ago and now, your mind, it wasn't before and now it is. Where did it come from? Do dreams, sounds, feelings, emotions, compassion, did it really come from chemicals? Tell me the branch of magical chemistry that allows for that. I've studied chemistry. There's no way. Tell me the bench of physics. It said, oh yeah, this is, this is the realm of physics where dreams come out of physical stuff. It's, it's, that's, that's wild. That's crazy. So if it doesn't come from matter, does it come from nothing? Do your thoughts, emotions, feelings, your mind, does it come out of, really actually come, pop out of nothing? How can anything come from nothing? Because it's nothing. That really makes no sense at all. And why would it happen now versus then? If it comes out of nothing, it should either never happen or always happen. So, what does your mind come from? And then the Buddhist answer is, well, as all constituents, everything that is solid in the universe emerges from archetypes of form, of earth element in the form realm, so does your mind also emerge from sign of the mind. The sign of the mind. Sign as in archetypal mind, primal mind. And so, let's see what the Buddha had to say about that. Not a whole lot, but here it is, and I've given you the sources in the Samyutta Nikaya. So the Buddha said, in this manner, monks, the wise, experienced, skillful monk abides in happiness here and now and is mindful and introspection as well. So he's talking about eudaimonia, that's for sure. Not eudonia. Abides in happiness here and now. What is the reason for that? Because monks, this wise, experienced, skillful monk acquires the sign of his own mind. Comes to identify, comes to know, realize the sign of his own mind. Or again, same passage, if, and this is paraphrase now, if one cultivates the four applications of mindfulness, that is classic vipassana, satipatthana, four close applications of mindfulness of body, feelings, mind, and phenomena. If one practices or cultivates the four applications of mindfulness without the mind being concentrated, without having already well-trained in the higher training in samadhi, shamatha, and without having abandoned the impurities, the five obscurations, if one practices vipassana without having achieved shamatha, dispelled the obscurations, then one does not acquire one's own mental sign, which means you do not fathom that from which your mind emerges. And what, from what does your mind, what is it from which your mind emerges? Bhavanga. Bhavanga is that from which your mind emerges into which it will dissolve at death or every time you fall asleep or when you temporarily, when you achieve shamatha. So he's pointing out something that's almost universally ignored in the modern people practicing vipassana nowadays. Hardly any of them bother with this. But what he's saying here is really makes sense. And that is Galileo was the first one to use a telescope in a scientific fashion. A telescope was invented up in Holland. He heard about it. He ordered one. He ordered one, you know, went to Amazon.com and asked him to send him one. <laughs> and so the carrier, the courier, brought him a telescope from Holland. But along the way, somebody saw the courier and said, what you got there? And got the telescope. How about I give you twice what Galileo would give you? And Galileo never got his, never got his telescope. He ordered it, and somebody nicked it on the way. And so he said, oh, crap, let's see what, they, what the Dutch people have done. He made his own telescope. Three power. Wow. Three power telescope. But during his lifetime, we went from three to eight to 12, up to 30 power. That's not bad for one guy. 30 power telescope is, you know, you can really discover some things with that. But of course, he knew exactly how to make a telescope from scratch, so to speak. And so he had some idea how it worked. And then having created his telescope, properly mounted the lenses, focused them, and so forth, cleaned them, and so forth. Then, knowing kind of what he was looking through, then he directed to uh, Jupiter, for example, and saw these little white dots around Jupiter, and, and then that's called Shamatha on Jupiter. Wow, there's Jupiter. There's Jupiter. But he noticed these little white dots around Jupiter. 
I wonder if they're background stars or whether they might not be. That's a question. And so he looked again and again from night to night and he found, lo and behold, as Jupiter moved across the background of the stars, those little white dots went with it, which means they're not background stars. They need to discover the moons of Jupiter. That was Vipassana. That was astronomical Vipassana. You ask a question and then you inquire until you get the definitive answer. That's Vipassana. But you better know that your telescope is a telescope and not a kaleidoscope. <laughs> you need to have some co confidence that what you're seeing through the telescope actually has something to do with what's out there and is not simply an aberration or a, what do they call it, an artifact. That what you're seeing is not simply an artifact of your lenses, like a bubble in the lens or a distorted lens. Oh, I see that m Jupiter is actually oblong. <laughs> nope, that's your lenses. So he had to know that. And he wouldn't be a dope and just get one and say, well, I'm sure it's good, and then just look right through it. What's the fundamental instrument that every scientist is using and engaging in any kind of research whatsoever? Human mind. So wouldn't it have made sense for him to first study and fathom the nature of the mind, and then use his mind to look through a telescope? Didn't do that. So it's 300 years before they even asked that question. What is the nature of the mind? How can we understand it scientifically, empirically? And so, before you engage in the contemplative science of closely applying mindfulness to your body, to fathom the nature of your, modi, your body, to fathom the nature of feelings, fathom the nature of your mind, fathom the nature of phenomena and their interrelatedness, then what Buddha is saying here is, first of all, fathom the nature of the instrument with which you're doing all of this inquiry. Fathom that from which it arises, the sign of the mind and you'll find happiness. You'll find all five jhana factors there. And then you're ready to go. That's professional contemplative science in Buddhism. Nowadays, hardly anybody does it. But it's fascinating to my mind. Okay, we're now lift off. We're getting om almost lift off. We'll come back to um, Pali Canon now and then. But now we're slipping from the, from the Pali Canon to Mahayana. We're going into Mahayana territory. So a classic, very renowned Mahayana Sutra discourse attributed to the Buddha in the context of Mahayana, the Samdhi Nemochana Sutra. Yeah, this is difficult, but it's worthwhile. This is in the, the questions and answers between Buddha and Maitreya in this renowned sutra. And so the Buddha is addressing Maitreya as follows. With continuous inner attention, that is attention drawn inwards, bodhisattvas mentally attend to that mind which is mentally contemplated by any mind. I've done the translation myself. I know it's very clunky, but it's literal and it's accurate. That means, though, it probably needs a bit of explanation. So you're directing awareness inwards. You mentally attend to that mind, which is mentally contemplated by any mind. In other words, you're looking at a mind that is universal. I can look at Alan Wallace's mind, and I'll see Alan Wallace's thoughts and desires and memories and so forth. That's not anybody's mind. I'm looking at my mind. But is my mind, Alan Wallace's mind, all the way up and all the way down? Is it 100% male, 100% American, 100% 69-year-old mind? Or can I plumb deeply enough that I'm seeing a dimension of my mind that could be anybody's mind? That's what it says, isn't it? Which is co mentally contemplated by any mind. The physical and mental pliancy, this is the buoyancy, suppleness, etc., that arises through engaging in this practice in this way and continuing in this practice is... Shamatha. This is how Bodhisattva seeks shamatha. So he's specifically addressing a practice in which you achieve shamatha by observing your mind and penetrating through the unique features of your mind to an underlying dimension of mind that is universal. Now here's an, I just thought of it, but here's a metaphor I like a lot. It's said, and I have no idea whether it's true or not, that every snowflake is unique. Ever hear that one? Trillions of them, right? But it said every one is unique. Well, maybe it is. What do I know? But let's imagine it's true. Every single snowflake in, in, on the planet that's ever fallen is unique, right? That may be true. I don't know. But what I can say is true beyond a shadow of a doubt is that your mind is unique. Your mind, it, it's completely unique in the whole entire universe with 100 billion galaxies. With each galaxy, something like 100 billion to a trillion stars per galaxy, your mind is absolutely unique. Of that, I'm completely sure. Don't you think so? Nobody has your parents. Nobody has your brain. Nobody has your body. 
You know, that's one of a kind. When you die, that mind will not be replicated by anybody ever. One, it's a one-off, <laughs> right? And so, and that's true everybody's mind, a frog's mind, a, a tadpole's mind, anybody. It's unique. Where you are located in space and time right now, nobody else is there. So you've just occupied a unique place in the grid of space-time within the universe. But then you look at that mind. It is unique. It has a gender to it, and it's old or young. It's Australian or Aborigine or what have you. I thought it was probably politically incorrect. I don't mean to be. So Australian or Bolivian, let's just put it that way. But it's configured by culture and so forth. But you let that mind settle in its natural state. And what that means is, I haven't actually told you before, when you have fully let your mind settle in its natural state, you've melted that snowflake of your mind into a drop of H2O. And that's mind settled in its natural state, unconfigured. It's the bhavanga. The bhavanga is not male, female, or anything else. So, so that's the method that Buddha was teaching Maitreya. By observing your mind, the uniqueness, uniqueness, and then just watching it melt. A lovely metaphor, we'll get to this tomorrow. It's going to be center stage tomorrow. It's like having a snow globe, you know, a snow globe. And when it's all shook up, you see all the little snowflake kind of things swirling all over the place. But if you just let it settle, then that snow globe settles in its natural state. And all those little flakes of pseudo-snow, they all settle on the base of the snow globe. And then you see it's just clear, transparent. Settle your mind in its natural state. And all those, the uniqueness of your mind, your thoughts, emotions, desires, memories, and so forth, they all settle. And all of your sensories implode. Because these are, phys these are physical, again, human, human sight, human sound. They all implode into the mind. The mind implodes into its natural state where it's unconfigured. And now you're seeing the mind that anybody, any mind could contemplate. Because it's the same. You've seen one, you've seen one drop of H2O, liquid H2O. You've seen them all, right? One drop, you've seen them all. You've seen one substrate consciousness, one bhavanga, you've seen them all. Right? Now freeze it, and then it'll be unique again. Configure your bhavanga with a human brain. Oh, now you've got a unique brain again, a unique, unique mind again. And so again, let's follow this. So this is interesting, and then we'll just move on. So Bhagavan, among the five obscurations, Maitreya asked the Buddha, Bhagavan, among the five obscurations, which is an obscuration to shamatha, and which is an obscuration to vipassana? Which is an obscuration to both of these? And the Buddha replied, Maitreya, excitation and anxiety are obscurations to shamatha. Laxity, dullness, and afflictive uncertainty are obscurations to vipassana. And hedonism and malice are obscurations to both. So in fact, all five obscurations are indeed obscuration to shamatha, but he's just highlighted the ones that are specifically obscuring or obstructing your achievement of shamatha, obstructing your insight into vipassana and those that are for both. Final quote before we go to another set of notes. Back to the wisdom, the perfection of wisdom sutra, this time the 8,000 verse. It's a very famous phrase. I know it in Tibetan, semni, semni, Semachite, semgyaranjan usawawo. Semgyaranjan, I would, I, I'm just seeing it right now. I know um, Yangchen has, has edited so many of my translations, I can see her intensely looking at my translation and said, it's not quite right. <laughs> She's really tough, I tell you, I'm not kidding. Actually, it'd be better, semni semachite, semni semachite, semni semachite. Mind is devoid of mind, or mind is not mind. Either one of those would work, don't you think? But then the other one, semki ranjin, or semki ranjin, that should be the ma for the manifest nature of mind. Semki ranjin. The manifest nature of mind is luminosity. If she weren't there, I would have let it pass, but she, she, she's a tough cookie. So there it is, the manifest nature of mind. But then, what's this saying? This is perfection of wisdom. This is domain of emptiness and dependent origination. The mind is empty of mind. That is, you, if you look for your mind, you look for your mind, and you'll see thoughts and images and motions and states of consciousness and laxity and dullness and clarity and so forth, look into your mind as long as you like and then show me exactly where the real mind stand up. I see all these features of the mind. But where's the mind that has all of those qualities? Where's the mind from which all those qualities emerge? Where's the mind that has mental afflictions, has virtues? Where's the haver? 
the mind that has all the qualities and functions of mind. Where is with the man? Hey, mind, the one that's responsible over this stuff, please stand up. Oh, funny thing. The mind is empty of mind. How funny, how strange. Just like your five skandhas, your five psychophysical constituents, whatever you call them, aggregates. You got a body, you have feelings, you have recognition, all kinds of mental formations, you have consciousness. And they all belong to you. They, they are yours. They are yours. They're your, your mind, your body. Simply put, it's your mind, your body. It's true. So please stand up. In fact, I'd like you to stand up, and, if, and, and not really, uh, but as a thought experiment, and I'm not going to, but I'm going to teach you a little bit, and that is, in a high thought experiment, I'd like you to stand up and set your body over here, and then you have a body, but you're not a body, so put your body over here, and then put your mind over here, and I'd like to just see you. And you find out the, the skandhas are empty of person, and your mind is empty of mind. Right? You don't have to do that. So the mind is empty of mind, and yet it's not non-existent, the fact that you're not your body, you're not your mind, and you can't be found elsewhere. That doesn't mean you don't exist. That's silly. But what's the manifest nature? What distinguishes mind as mind? Well, it's luminous. That's what makes mind, mind. And from a Buddhist perspective, and frankly, I'm going to say this is simply true, every system of artificial intelligence you can ever conceive may be very good at pretending as if it's a mind, perform functions that a mind might function or perform, but it's not artificial intelligence. It's pretend intelligence. It's a facsimile of intelligence. Artificial intelligence would be an artificial heart is something that does everything a heart does, except it's manufactured rather than grown. But artificial intelligence is in fact not intelligent at all because, because Siri, Siri actually isn't a person at all. Oh, I've lost my e internet. I wanted to ask you a question, but probably no time now. Probably not. But Siri's not a person. Siri doesn't know anything at all. Siri's not a person. It's just, it's just a program with a woman's voice. So I won't do it now. It'd be fun, but I won't do it. Um, so what makes the mind the mind? How is the mind different from a robot or a computer or artificial intelligence? The mind is luminous. The mind experiences. And simply an algorithm with a bunch of silicon chips doesn't experience or know anything at all. And so, that takes us then to the other set of notes. So let's go, let's go over to page 17. I think we all have the same notes. Siri, do you actually know anything at all? Is there something else I can help with? <laughs> Siri, do you experience anything at all? I don't have an answer for that. Is there something else I can help with? She may be dumb, but she's honest. And it's not a she at all, so that was not a sexist statement. There's no woman there either. So that's it. That was a good answer. I don't have an answer for that because I don't have a program for that. And if, if, if I did, I'd be lying to you. So there we are. So now we've covered, I've pretty much said what I wanted to share, I wanted to share with you with respect to four modalities of mindfulness of breathing with the conceptual framework in which it's to be understood and at no point is any leap of faith. You can practice shamatha and think all that stuff about the bhavanga is a bunch of hui, rubbish, bollocks. You don't have to believe in it. Nobody's asking you to believe in it. But what they're stating is, if you achieve shamatha, that's what you're going to discover. So, that's either true or false, but that's an empirical question, not a religious statement or an invitation to faith. But now, when we hear about achieving shamatha, and there's quite a universal statement or recognition in Tibetan Buddhism, if you've achieved access to the first jhana, you've achieved shamatha, then at the bare minimum, you can go into, you can rest in that bhavanga with your senses completely imploded, the mind gone completely silent, and you can rest there in an ongoing flow of luminous, clear, cognizant awareness for at least four hours at a stretch. Effortlessly, effortlessly, four hours minimum. That's widely recognized. I've not heard anybody ever contest that. And just a couple of weeks ago, I had the tremendous privilege of inviting two 
Santa Barbara, where I have a home that I actually visit sometimes, uh, a Bhutanese Lama that spent 16 years. Now, this is professional. He started meditating when he was about nine, meditated seriously for 20 years, a wide variety of Vajrayana practices. His name is Lama Kama. And after 20 years of practicing a wide variety of all kinds of practices, including Vajrayana, and Dummo, and etc., then he told his mentor, who was a fabulous yogi, very accomplished yogi, he said he'd really like to practice shamatha. And his teacher until, until that point was, oh, you want to do that? Great, fine, fine. And then when he said, I'd like to achieve shamatha, then his teacher said, now, now you're talking. And he went into a strict retreat. His teacher was completely mentoring him in it. And for six months, he, he was told, stay in your cabin, only come out at night so you, nobody, you'll not see anybody, nobody will see you, and just practice all the time. And after six months, he had achieved shamatha. His teacher told him, you've now achieved shamatha, and then told him what to do next. And I asked him, how many sessions were you practicing per day during that six months? That's very efficient. Six months, not bad. And he said, sessions, I was practicing all the time. That's a professional. And then he went on, for, from that point, he went on to 16 years in full-time meditation retreat. That's professional. And he was, he was, he was and is, he's, not, he's not very old either. He's only about 60, 63 maybe. Uh, he's a wish-fulfilling jewel. If, if, he, if he can get an interpreter for him and invite him here to Australia, he's really something. Have you had Kandola yet? Oh, fantastic. So we have, for the center we're planning to create in Tuscany, we have two Tibetans who have agreed to come and teach, Kandola and Lama Kama. Two Nobel laureates, as far as I'm concerned. So these people know what they're talking about. But now, when we hear about that, achieving shamatha, there was nowhere in the notes, was there? I don't think I saw it. I'm surprised that it, maybe I skipped it inadvertently. Yeah. I'm surprised. I did leave it out. Okay, I'm going to put it in. You'll get something that's not here. Somehow, when I was making the notes for this retreat, I left out a couple of statements. This is kind of important. It's very brief, and we'll get on with it. But Buddha Gosa, in this definitive, classic, authoritative text for the whole Theravada tradition, he states, and I quote him very, I, I paraphrase him very, very closely, when you have achieved, fully achieved the first jhana, not just access, but fully achieved the first jhana, and I won't go right now to the distinction between that. It's subtle, but it's just significant, when you've achieved, fully achieved the first jhana, then you can go into samadhi and remain continuously in samadhi for 24 hours at a stretch. And then he says, like a strong man who can remain standing for, for a full night and a full day, 24 hours, without ever f falling over. Like that, you can go into samadhi for 24 hours straight. And that means all your senses imploded, single-pointed, luminous, clear, all five jhana factors functioning. Now that's just the gold standard. That's not my opinion. That's just the way it is. And there are a lot of people nowadays, Westerners, Burmese, etc., who are claiming to achieve the first jhana and far more. A lot of claims. And I'm sorry to say, I, I really don't like saying this at all. But I've looked at them, one after another after another, and ev almost every single time I've been disappointed because it's just not the gold standard. They water it down, they bring John, John is down to their level, and they say they've achieved something, but it's not the gold standard. So if anybody, you know, any Buddhist teacher says, I've achieved the first jhana, just the first, let alone all four jhanas, let alone some people claiming to have achieved all the samatis, the absorptions and formula from. There are a number of people claiming that. Whew. But if they even claim to have achieved the first jhana, then I invite you courteously to say, this is wonderful. That's a very impressive claim. Then, of course, you're able to sit in samadhi for 24 hours straight without moving a muscle and be in deep, deep samadhi. So you could not, if I take a pair of cymbals and crash them right next to your ear, you won't even flinch. Of course, that goes without saying. Would you like to demonstrate the truth of what you just said? That's fair, isn't it? It's not being sarcastic or it's just saying, if you can, then if, if, if you're making that claim, then shut up, put up or shut up, as we say in America. But most there's a lot of claims for that, and, and I have not found one. Lama Kama, yeah. But there are lots of counterfeit money floating around. But whether you're talking about access to the first jhana or full jhana, it seems like a long way to go. 
compared to where we are right now. But happily, and this is especially a strength of the Indo-Tibetan tradition, and especially m much of what I've learned about this and have synthesized here, uh, is from the Galupa tradition, the great, great master Tsongkhapa, late 14th, early 15th century. But a lot of oral transmission pith instructions I've received from other sources, never met him personally. But you can break it down, achieving shamatha, access to the first jhana, you can break that down to nine stages. And there's stages, stages of evolution. They're not nine, very important this, they're not nine goals to achieve. Any more than when you plant a, a, a seed for, let's say, a chrysanthemum, then you don't have the goal that the seed will germinate and drop down a little tap. That's not a goal. And then after some time, you'll see the shoot. That's not a goal. And then you see the, those are not goals. That's just what happens when this seed comes to full blossom as a chrysanthemum bush. And so as Penchen, the Penchen Lama, Penchen Lhasa Chungi Yanzen, who is the tutor of the fifth Dalai Lama, said in the text that I've studied and received transmission for, that whatever practice you follow of shamatha, if you achieve shamatha, it will be by way of these nine stages. So let's see what they are. So shamatha looks like quite distant, quite difficult. And they say hardly anybody's achieved it nowadays. But let's look at it step by step. We'll go fairly briskly here. But these are nine, sta nine steps to attentional balance, the path of shamatha. And there's nothing original from here for me at all. This is not Alan Wallace's version. This is taking multiple sources and just putting them in this nice clean format. Contents all traditional, rooted in 100 generations of yogi's experience. So in the first of the nine stages, the first one is called, in English translation, directive attention. And so this is where you've, okay, you've entered the path of shamatha, you've gotten somewhere. You're now in the first stage out of nine. And so what is achieved when you achieve this first stage is you are able to direct your attention to the chosen object. That's it. And so if your chosen object is the tactile sensations of the in and out flow of the breath at your nostrils, if you're able to identify those sensations, or a Sangha's method, if you're able to experience the fluctuations in the body corresponding to the respiration, if you're able to note that, detect that. Um, was there anyone here who was not able just didn't get what I'm talking about. Draw a blank when you're, when you're trying to sense the sensations of breathing throughout the body. Did anybody not experience that? You don't have to be embarrassed. Then, you, then I have to give you certific certificates. You've all achieved the first of nine stages. Congratulations, you did that in only a day or two. And we only have eight more to go. So how difficult could this be? You've already achieved the first stage, congratulations. You've achieved so, you have done that. And the power by which you achieve this is learning the instructions. I gave instruction, guided meditations, you understood, you practiced, you achieved. Vini, vini, vici. You saw, you came, you conquered. And so, that's how you do it. The power of, the power of hearing, it's called. What, powers, what problems persist now that you've achieved, you all achieve at least the first stage, what problems are there is there's no attentional continuity on the object. You just can't stay focused. You can't stay focused. That is, you find, let's say, the sensations in a matter of seconds, you're off doing something else. And then you come back and then off. And so there's just basically no continuity at all. This is what William James discovered more than a century ago, is people have very limited capacity to sustain their attention on anything. There's a, a psychologist at, used to be at Harvard, then Stanford, I think maybe Stanford still, Stephen Coslin got to know him, world-class cognitive psychologist who studied mental imagery, mental imagery with Harvard undergraduates. And he found, he told me this maybe 15 years ago, working with these very bright Harvard undergraduate students, that the longest any of them could focus in a continuous fashion on a mental image, seven, se seven seconds, seven seconds, and they've lost it, you know? So that should, comes as no surprise. So that's it, you just really, there's just so much turbulence, so much activity, so much chaos in the mind can't stay focused on anything. So in other words, this is normal. It's very easy to think, oh, that shouldn't be happening. I probably suck. I'm no good at this. That's normal. That's what should happen. That's the way it is in the first stage. And so why is this? Why can't you maintain focus? This is not ADHD. This is ordinary people because of what's called coarse excitation. So let's flip over to page 19. Do you see where I'm coming from? This is from Pith Instruction from Genlam Rimba. And he was a Galupa yogi with whom I lived for a year. 
and I was under his guidance for a couple of years, close to, spent about 25 years in retreat, accomplished yogi, marvelous man. And so he brought in the subtlety from the oral transmission and from his own practice. So of course excitation occurs when your attention completely disengages from the meditative object. So you're sitting down to follow the sensations of the breath and you're thinking about pepperoni pizza or something else that has nothing to do with the practice. You've completely forgotten it. That's called course excitation. You look like you're meditating, but you're sitting there with a wandering mind. That's course excitation. And so, that's the problem. The type of mental engagement is focused. You really have to put your mind to it. Now these final two points, uh, I will tell you right now, these pertain really explicitly to the method we'll start practicing tomorrow. So it's not quite accurate for mindfulness of breathing, but I'll mention them now anyway and then come back to it after we've looked into the practice we'll investigate tomorrow. The quality of experience, what's it feel like is movement. You're following your breath, for example, and what you experience is just movement. There's just so much stuff happening in the mind, memories, thoughts, images, all kinds of stuff. Movement and the flow of involuntary thoughts, the rumination, the OCDD, like a cascading waterfall. So that's normal. But you continue practicing, don't give up, don't give up. Have a strong motivation, see that this is really worth doing, and continue your practice, and soon or later, depending on how gifted you are, you will achieve continuous attention. And what occurs here is that you have attentional continuity on the chosen object for up to a minute. So if, for example, you're having 24-minute sessions, within that 24-minute period, on occasion, you may be able to maintain continuity for as long as about a minute or so. Tibetans didn't have wristwatches for almost the entire history of Tibet, but they could say, O mani peh and they can go, O mani peh once around the rosary, and that's about a minute. So that's what they say. On occasion, you can maintain continuity for about as long as you can say, O mani peh 108 times, so roughly a minute. So then you have some continuity, some continuity. Well, that's better than having none. And how do you get that? By thinking, the power of thinking about the practice. The thinking is going over the instructions again and again, getting very, very familiar with them, understanding them conceptually, and then going to the practice, understanding what's the referent of introspection, what is course excitation, what is mindfulness, what are the sensations. So you really, you should really get very familiar with it by reflecting upon it. And another aspect of thinking is, in the context of mindfulness of breathing, counting the breaths. Helps you develop some continuity. But now, at this second stage, the problem that persists is most of the time the attention is not on the object. In a 24-minute period, you're spending less than 12 minutes on the object, and most of the time off, just on anything else, completely having forgotten the meditative object. But then you come back to it and stay for 10 seconds, you're gone. Two seconds, you're gone. 30 seconds, you're gone. One minute, and you're gone. But on occasion, you have a really good spell of actually being on the topic. Most of the time, you're off. So this is, let me know when you feel nobody could achieve this. But so far, quite peaceable, yeah? And so most of the time your attention is not on the object. And why? Course excitation. You keep on forgetting it entirely. Bear in mind, mindfulness is bearing in mind without forgetfulness, and without distraction. Well, you're not forgetting it. But here you are forgetting it. You're still subject to course excitation. And that's when your mindfulness just falls apart. Then in terms of mental engagement, staying the same, you really engage, you have to focus. Still a lot of extents of movement, still cascading waterfall, keep on going. Persistence, persistence. And then you'll move on to, over time, resurgent attention. And here, the distinguishing characteristic is that you, there's swift recovery of distracted attention, which is now mostly on the object. So you're developing a bit better skills of introspection. So your mind is going to still completely forget the object. But you don't forget it for 10 seconds at a time. You forget it for maybe two seconds, and introspection says, hey, you've lost it, and brings you back. And so you're still losing it, but introspection is good enough that you've slipped into laxity, ab above all, into distraction. You recognize it quickly and bring it back. Relax, release, and then return. So your times away are shorter, because introspection is like training a sentry, training a guard to, uh, you know, the, the, the sentry, the monitor, to pick up aberrations quickly, more quickly than you do pick it up. So, what are the problems? Oh, the, the, the power by which you achieve it is mindfulness. You're getting better at bearing in mind without forgetfulness or distraction the object of meditation. So it's mindfulness that gets you there. Mindfulness is coming into its strength gradually. 
Problem persists when still forgets the object entirely for brief periods. But the distinction between this and the second is, in the previous one, most of the time you're off, off doing something else. And now most of the time, at least 13 minutes out of 24, um, you're, on the, you're on the target, you're on target. And then 18 minutes, you're on target. 20 minutes, you're on target. So this doesn't sound too bad, not too difficult. And again, why do you lose it at all? Why do you still completely forget what you're doing? Of course, excitation. That's the problem. And the type of mental engagement, the way you're engaging with the object here, is interrupted. That is, mostly you're on the object, but then you forget it, and it's interrupted. Relax, release, return, and you come back, and then you're on it, and then you forget again. Interrupted. It's called interrupted here, where, as you can see in the first stage, there's no continuity. The second, not very good continuity. Now, pretty good continuity. But this is called interrupted, whereas the first two are not. And the reason for that is that in the first two, it's not that your meditation is in interrupted by distraction, but rather your wandering mind is occasionally interrupted by meditating. <laughs> okay, so this is, this is good, moving in the right direction. Again, we'll come to these final two points probably tomorrow. But now keep on going, don't be distracted. And now that you know, you don't get your expectations too high. You don't think, I should be good at this, and I suck, I guess I'm probably really bad at this. Well, that's not bad, that's just the way it is. That's the way it is, that's the way it is. And you don't take these as targets or goals to be achieved, but it lets you know when you're in the first stage, don't expect more than this. And as you go deeper, this is it, but don't expect more. Get to the third stage, don't expect more. It's easy to expect more and then feel a sense of failure and low self-esteem and I'm no good at this and then give up. So this is gradual, it's user-friendly. We'll go to the fourth one and then we'll call it an afternoon. Close attention, now this is a big one, this is a benchmark. Close attention. What's achieved here is one no longer completely forgets the chosen object. Now, of course, if you meditate over 10 hours here, you forget it, but let's say over these first three stages, you probably, if you start at 24, after a while you may go to 27, 30 minutes, maybe three minute increments. By the time you get to stage four, you may be meditating for 45 minutes at a stretch, maybe an hour at a stretch. And so, not really long, but you know, getting in there a bit. And when your normal session, you'll always have really good sessions occasionally and really bad sessions occasionally. Throw those out statistically. Your normal session, in your normal session, you sit down for 45 minutes and you're meditating for 45 minutes. That is, you don't completely forget the object. If that's your normal, knowing that once, once in a while you have a bad day and sometimes you have a really great day, if that is your median, your normal, then you've achieved the fourth stage. And that's kind of nice. There, the stability is relatively good, and you can imagine that would be quite peaceful, not to be buffeted here and there by distracted mind. The power by which you achieve that is mindfulness, which is now strong, as you're not completely forgetting your object for the duration of your session. But now what can happen here, especially if you don't know all of the nine stages, what happens so often is people not knowing anything about this think they've achieved shamatha, you know, when they're not even in near, they're not even in the ballpark, they're not even near. But they haven't been blessed by teachers like mine and by Tsongkhapa and many sources I've cited. So it's very easy. It happens so often. The first Theravada monk that I first, I met way back when, he described his accomplishments. He said he'd achieved all of the jhanas and all of the samapatis. And I was already something of a scholar, and I didn't say anything, but he was wildly mistaken. But he hadn't studied. He's not stupid. He wasn't being arrogant or anything, but he hadn't studied. He hadn't had really good instruction. And so in good faith, his exaggeration of his accomplishments was just wildly ridiculous. But he didn't know. And that's it's sad. Because if you think you've already achieved something, then you'll never achieve it because you think you're already there. And that's too bad. So I say that with sympathy, not with condescension, because how do I know about any of this stuff? Because of the blessings of my teachers and Tsongkhapa, the great beings of the past. So if you didn't know better, by the time you can sit down at, in most of your sessions, sit down and boom, you're in flow, session after session after session, that's normal, then you might feel, hey, this is samadhi, this is cool, I've arrived. What am I, am I an arhat yet? What is, what is, this is really good, must be jhana, has to be jhana. 
and then be a complacent. I'm not forgetting my object anymore. Then that, that's, this is samadhi. This is what I wanted. So you maybe have some degree of complacency. But what you may not have noticed is, although you've overcome coarse excitation, you're still utterly subject to coarse laxity and medium excitation. Over at page 19, coarse, coarse laxity. Coarse laxity occurs when your attention mostly disengages from the object due to insufficient vividness. So you're not being distracted elsewhere, but you might remember my little skit. I, kind of, I did it so you'd remember it. When I was focusing on Ben, when I was there, I didn't go like this. I wasn't looking all over the place. I just, it, it, the Tibetan word for laxity is jingwa, which means to sink. So you can call it either floating away or I'm sinking back into my own, like that. And so that's coarse excitation. You've completely lost clarity. But you're not distracted. There's just no clarity there. That's coarse laxity. And you're subject to this. You can imagine it. Imagine you've gotten to stage four, session after session after session. You just aren't wandering, but you get complacent and you just start settling into coarse laxity and it's really peaceful. You may as well take an sedative. You know, and, and then if you think at samadhi, wow, are you sadly mistaken? And so that's coarse laxity. And then we, we have medium excitation. And medium excitation occurs when involuntary thoughts occupy the center of attention while the meditative object is displaced to the periphery. So I'm just going to go a couple of minutes over. And so in this case, let's imagine you're focusing on the sensations of the nostrils and you're experiencing medium excitation. This means you're not completely forgetting it, but as you're breathing in, breathing in, I think there's a little bit of dessert left over. I think that'd be, I think I like some dessert when I get back to my house. Breathing in, oh, breathing out, yeah. But I want to make sure there's, there's enough for somebody else. Oh, but some orange juice and, and sparkling water would be really nice. Oh, I think there's some Turkish delight in the fridge. <laughs> Breath, I'm with you. Don't worry, I'm with you. I'm with you. I'm, I'm still with you. I love Turkish delight. <laughs> so you're humoring the breath. Don't worry, I'm with you. But Turkish delight is much more interesting than breathing. That's medium excitation. And so the, the type of mental engagement is an interrupted. Now it's not interrupted by coarse excitation. It's interrupted by coarse laxity and medium excitation. Quality of achievement, of experience is achievement, and then the metaphor is different. We'll come back to that tomorrow, probably. But that gives you that gives you the entry. That's the four stages. That's four out of nine. That's a lot of territory. And overall, you see that what's addressed as the problem for these first three, and then dispelled in the fourth, is coarse excitation. Coarse excitation means you're completely forgetting the object, right? And so that's happening because there's so much rumination. So generally, statistically speaking, generically speaking, if you'd like to be very efficient in achieving those four stages, those first four stages, mindfulness breathing might be just what the doctor ordered. Because it's specifically designed for people with a lot of mind wandering, a lot of rumination, and so forth. And gently, breath by breath by breath, you're calming the waves, calming the turbulence of your conceptual mind. So overall, it can be a very effective, efficient way to move through those first four stages. Okay. That's gener generic. For some people, there will be other methods more, more effective. But that introduces you to the first four out of nine. So we'll take a break now, and I look forward to seeing you all at 9 o'clock tomorrow morning.